Hello friends, welcome back to my series on GABA. Today we're going to be talking about how to improve concentration and specifically memory from the manipulation of the GABAergic system, which is something I never thought I would be saying. When I originally decided to research this series for my book, the main interest I had generally was in trying to find out, because Basically, my main interest was in improving the inhibitory uh, ratio of my of my nervous system, Impro like reducing excitatory activity and improving inhibitory activity. I didn't actually think that any kind of modulation of the GABAergic system could uh, acutely improve uh, memory formation, for example, but it turned out to be the opposite. So in this episode, I want to tell you guys about two um, targets for cognitive enhancement with the GABAergic system, specifically. If you recall, the GABA-A receptors, which are the targets of the benzodiazepines, they are made out of 19 genes, which, in, which code for uh, subtypes of the receptor, including the alpha subtypes, the beta, delta, gamma, and so on. We discussed in the last episode why the alpha-1 subtypes and the alpha-5 subtypes also are very are, are integrally tied to the hypnotic and sedative effects of benzodiazepines, as well as the dependence effects. Instead, on the other hand, we found out that the alpha-2 and alpha-3 subtypes are very involved in the anxiolytic effects and anti-hyperanalgesic effects, which means pain reduction and anxiety uh, reducing. So the alpha-2 and alpha-3 seem to be great targets, and the alpha-1s were uh, maybe something we didn't want to target. Well, in this episode, I want to tell you guys a little bit more about those alpha-5s. The alpha-5 uh, subtype of the GABA-A receptors that grouping, including an alpha-5, are mostly found extrasynaptically. Extrasynaptic GABA receptors in the brain sense what's called tonic inhibition. Tonic inhibition is when GABA, see GABA is communicated through axons and then between neurons, where a neuron will send it to another neuron, right? But as you recall, those GABA transporters took GABA out of that, the synaptic cleft between the neurons, out of there and into the uh, space of the brain. When GABA is in that space, it can agonize the uh, receptors that are involved in what's called tonic inhibition. That GABA in the extracellular space is a tone, so that's the tonic inhibition. So, GABA-A receptors are actually found in this extrasynaptic space. They contain alpha-5 subunits. What's been found is that, so specifically, if you can block these alpha-5 subunit containing GABA-A receptors, uh, long-term potentiation is improved. Uh, um, for example, rodents that don't have the alpha-5 subunit have uh, better memory. Um, antagonizing those uh, subunits directly improves long-term potentiation in, in uh, rodents, increases their hippocampal activity, and improves their memory formation. Of course, the problem with antagonizing these GABA-A receptors that contain the alpha-5 subunit is that some of the chemicals that have been uh, used to do this have produced proconvulsant, meaning they gave rodents tremors, or anxiogenic effects in rodents. But it seems to be that the reason this happened was that those chemicals were not very selective for the alpha-5 subunits. So the more that those compounds antagonized GABA-A receptors that contain the alpha-2 or alpha-3 subunits, the more that happened. So there are a bunch of chemicals that are selective for uh, antagonizing the alpha-5 containing GABA-A subunits. Sorry for this mouthful. There are a bunch of them. I don't know if you guys are interested. If you are interested, the ones I would most look into are Merck's alpha-5IA, uh, uh, which was in clinical trials, uh, first stage clin clin clinical trials as late as 2018 or uh, RO-493-85881. Those are two attractive ones, but there are other molecules. Basically, the, the, more the more selective they are for antagonizing only the alpha-5 containing ones, the better the effects will be. But it's not just the GABA-A receptors that are involved in this. Remember, the GABA-B receptors are not only uh, located presynaptically, but they are mostly located extrasynaptically. So they're even more commonly found than the alpha-5 containing GABA-A subunits in the extrasynaptic space, or at least more cleanly found like that. So what's been shown is that agonizing the GABA-A, GABA-B receptors, like with uh, baclofen or something like that, will cause memory impairment in the short term. And trust me, this is true. Uh, for this series, I've experimented with a ton of chemicals, and I can tell you very much, with, the, with very much certainty, that this is very much true. It's very interesting. GABA-B receptor agonism, or GABA-B activity, seems uh, like counterproductive for memory formation and so on. Obviously, we'll get to why at the end. 
On the other hand, blocking GABA-B receptors has been shown promising in improving memory formation and long-term potentiation. And for example, the first bioavailable, uh, first orally bioavailable drug to do this is called CGP36742. It produced an antidepressant effect by upregulating brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, although its human trial was abandoned. And there's also other CGP uh, versions. Now, at the end of this, what's the commonality? Why are blocking some GABA-A receptors and some GABA-B receptors helpful for memory formation? I'm sure most of you got it by now, but basically this is it. Remember, the GABA, A, the GABA, GABA system is the main inhibitory system in our body, with the main excitatory nervous system being the one that involves glutamate. The glutamatergic activity is excitatory. The GABAergic activity is inhibitory. That excitatory to inhibitory ratio affects not only the rate of damage that you get in your brain, when you have more, too much exci excitation in your brain, you'll damage your brain very quickly. This could also happen the reverse. But not only does it do that, but also when your brain is excitatory, you can form memories better and store them better. And when your brain is told not to work by inhibitory signals, obviously it's harder to store memories and save them. So is this like really a trick to cognitive enhancement? Not that much in my opinion. It's mainly basically telling you that if you, may, if you inhibit too much in the brain, memory formation will be reduced. So obviously if you reduce some of that inhibition, memory formation will be increased as well. If something is selective enough that it can only target the alpha-5 subunits and not affect uh, anxiogenic or pro-convulsant effects, it will still reduce tonic inhibition in the nervous system, which I think in the long term would cause some kind of irritability. So what I'm trying to say is, this is no free lunch. It's mainly about changing the excitatory to inhibitory ratio, but it's still very interesting. So I hope you guys found this interesting. I'll see you next time with another installment on the GABA series.